Welcome to Solar Tech Talk, where we nerd out about solar industry news and technology. I'm Aaron Bingham, product manager with Baywa RE. And I'm Tierney Marsh, a strategic account manager with Baywa RE. My gosh, Tierney, the last week in particular, we are recording this June 10th, Friday, mm -hmm. June 10th. And the last week in particular has been quite interesting. What's yes. a what's a quick overview to, to catch folks up on, on what we've seen? Well, starting Monday, of course, we heard from the White House that they are going to place a 24 month reprieve on new tariffs. And so while that doesn't change the outcome of the Oxen petition, it does give a reprieve to installers who were looking at limited supply here in in the short term. Basically, as you know, a lot of vendors had stepped back from sending product to the United States because they were concerned about retroactive duties being applied to their product. And there was a lot of discussion about who would take that risk and who would take that potential um, price increase. So what this does is it gives the industry a lot more certainty and it will allow installers across the country to have much more steady supply of modules, which is really something that we've been looking for of late. I think it's important to highlight that we're not expecting this to change in, we're not gonna have a, a new flood of modules in the next month or two. It is still gonna take time for vendors who, manufacturers who have halted production or halted shipments to the United States, it's still gonna take time to restart that process. But we are going to see a lot more options for uh, modules coming through the end of the year. So that is a really positive sign. The other piece of this, there's now some incentives in place, right, with the Deven Defense Protection Act, which is going to allow domestic module manufacturers to kind of restart their operations or um, invest in that more heavily. So what the Biden administration is doing is really trying to to find that red that that through line right of being able to support domestic manufacturers and support the industry, which was really going to be hogtied by this um, if we were continuing to see um, downward supply of modules. Yeah, I know that a lot of businesses are really scrambling. A lot of utility scale mm -hmm. projects have been canceled. There's been a lot of movement around this petition from Oxen in terms of module availability um, and where those where those module manufacturer resources are being dedicated that could be dedicated to making modules for the United States market, right? A lot of those manufacturers turned their attention to other markets or maybe right. even slowed down or stopped production lines and stopped their procurement processes for U.S. product because they did not see the market as viable under under those under those conditions of a potential retroactive tariff. Mm -hmm. So the certainty is fantastic. I think you're you're absolutely right. It's going to take time to go into effect and you know the solar coaster being what it is, there may be other legal action that happens that, you know, throws another wrench in the system. Um, of so we'll just have to <laughs> stay tuned and make sure that we keep talking with each other, keep working with each other and keep um, advocating for ourselves and our industry um, in terms of what kind of government policy we need to see that's really going to help us grow and help us decarbonize the, the US infrastructure. Right. Aaron, I hear you've been sharing your expertise with some folks. Can you tell us what's been going on with you lately? You know, um, this week I had the really fantastic opportunity to go speak at the Woodmac Solar and Storage Summit that was happening in San Diego, California. And I was there to share a little bit about my experience in the residential solar plus storage space and talk through a, a bit about um, the supply crunch that we've been seeing and some best practices that installers can can do to make sure that they are um, working with their suppliers to ensure the, the best possible supply outlook that they can. Um, so it was really, really fun. Some very, very fantastic sessions were put on by the Woodmac team. So I'm really glad that I got to participate in, and be in there amongst such a talented crowd. I mean, it sounds like you're an expert here. What were you telling our installer or what were you telling the Woodmac team? What should our installers know about how, how they should be weathering this supply chain storm? 
Yeah, it was the Woodmac team and it was professionals from all over the industry. And I really focused in on how um, installers planning on adding energy storage to their offering have some legwork that they need to do. They need mm -hmm. to plan with their suppliers, develop resources internally to support forecasting in terms of what's actually going to be installed and make sure that that's being communicated on a regular basis with their distribution partners. They need to engage with manufacturers to take advantage of the, the training and make sure that they're in line with any certification requirements that exists. And they need to make sure that they are kind of managing customer demand in a way that makes sense. One of the elements of the prompt for the session was, you know, how can the industry catch up to overwhelming customer demand? And while, um, you know, there is a lot of demand out there for solar plus storage, not all of it is equal, right? Some mm -hmm. customers are better customers than other customers. And so I was just encouraging installers to keep their wits about them as they're out there working with their prospects and make sure that they are looking out for those customers who can accept, you know, the current limitations of the technology and work within the the guidelines that the installer is going to be uh, needing to lay out for them as they commission the system. So if you go ahead and follow the Wood, Wood McKinsey LinkedIn profile, they'll be posting different bits of content that they recorded during, during the event. I'm not sure if they'll actually be posting the full sessions. I think that folks mm -hmm. who are registered for the event can gain access. And so there may be a way for folks to reach out to Wood McKinsey and, and ask about gaining access because there's a lot of great information about what's happening with the, with the industry more broadly. Um, a lot of it was focused on policy, but also some focus on technology and general market trends, market insights that I think would be interesting for, for some folks who are, who are looking at the industry kind of from a higher level. Yeah, definitely. So Tierney, we are very fortunate today to be joined by Magnus Aspo. He is the Senior Director of Technical Marketing over at Solar Edge Technologies, and he's joined us today to tell us a little bit more about the new Solar Edge battery, as well as talk about some of the resources that they're implementing uh, Solar Edge battery sales easier for installers who are out there pitching pitching the idea to their customers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he's going to dive into a little bit about smart home and batteries with DC connection. So I'm really interested in hearing more what he has to say about that. Magnus, welcome. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here, Tune. And we're happy to have you. So can you just like set the stage here for us? What's going on with the smart energy home of the future? What should we be thinking about? What should our installers know about? Well, I, I guess I'd start off with a couple of comments on things that I think that a lot of us are aware of as you know, sort of individual news events, but which are really coming together to drive how energy is used in the home in a very different way. So let's recount a couple of things. First of all, we're seeing much more electrification of everything. A couple of years ago, all of us were installing natural gas stoves, natural gas heaters. Uh, we were having natural gas clothes dryers. We're seeing a lot more electrification. What are the drivers of that? One of them really is that we're seeing the cost and the uncertainty around fossil fuels is uh, increasing. Just look at the uncertainty that's driven from the Russian invasion of U Ukraine, the crisis that we saw last winter in Texas. We're seeing a couple of uh, fairly big forces that are making us less certain about how natural gas is, is being used. Kind of driven by that, we're seeing the price for that kind of uh, energy going up. I mean, Energy Sage had a nice article back in April where they were quoting the Energy Information Administration showing that people are paying about 30% more for uh, fossil energy than they were a year ago just to heat their homes. We're also, in addition to seeing those increases in fossil fuel costs go up, we're also seeing that people are using devices that are more uh, suited to uh, to electricity. Like, you know, the obvious one that we would talk about would be EVs. Yeah. Uh, so we're really seeing that uh, the uptake in EVs is taking off. We've all expected that. Uh, the latest uh, figure that I see is that the growth rate is around 24.5% uh, every year of, uh, of EV use. And that means that the electricity use is going to be increasing over time. The vast majority of those EVs are being charged at home. I mean, despite our uh, interest in fast EV chargers, the reality is that most people come home and they plug in. In addition to that, however, we really should mention that 
the desire to, to go from a simple AC driven EV charger to something that's more DC based is uh, is taking over. So for instance, we saw Ford introduce the uh, F-150 Lightning, you know, with the, with the press at least, and people are starting to take uh, a receipt of their cars. Those cars are going to be able to do things like keep the home powered when they're off grid. However, the EV charge, the EV manufacturers are going to be do that, doing that through the DC bus rather than the AC bus. So that's been uh, repeated by Ford. Uh, our understanding is that GM is going in a similar direction and probably will expect to see that there's going to be a lot more DC interaction of EVs with the home than we saw previously. So Magnus, would you say that that is one of the primary pieces that's driving DC coupling or is there another factor that we should be aware of? Well, the way that we look at it is there is more use of DC because of that, of that EV use. But the other side of it is that as the electrification of the home continues forward, you know, we don't buy a new house just because we're electrifying something. We take the house as it is. And you may find yourself in a case where the main panel is simply outgrown the use. So for instance, I happen to live in a, uh, a bungalow that was built uh, early part of the 20th century. It has a 100 amp service panel. I was forced with the difficult decision of trying to decide whether I was going to have an electric stove, which requires uh, uh, real electricity to use, or to have an EV charger. So you have to have those forced decisions or be forced into a main panel upgrade. We actually see the use of DC as being very advantageous because it takes some of the burden off of the existing AC infrastructure and allows you to directly use the PV that you're generating for uses that you may actually have without having to overload the main panel. So that's why we see a lot of uses for uh, for DC coupling. It's also worth mentioning that what we uh, definitely do see is that if you have a lot of natively DC devices connected to the AC uh, infrastructure, you have to have inverters in the way. So right, so, so if you have a DC battery and you, and you hook it up to the AC uh, panel, you have to have inverters going both ways. You're going to lose energy that way. Same thing if you have a, a, a DC charger for your car, but it has to hook up to the AC panel. Now you're going to have losses there, additional costs. Uh, so going to a, a more DC-based paradigm really cuts down on costs in the long run, and it also increases the efficiency of the home, while at the same time making it so that your likelihood of having to do uh, you know, a service upgrade or a main panel upgrade is decreased. Just to make sure that everybody who's listening is up, up to speed and on the same page, when we talk about creating this kind of DC-based ecosystem, what are some of the advantages that system owners would experience in real time? It, you, you kind of hint at one with the lack of inverters on either side of the equation. There's something there about efficiency. What are some of the other advantages that you think so, folks would be interested to know about? Oh, sure. The uh, prime one that we really see with kind of our core business with uh, PV and then uh, battery storage of the PV that you generate is that if you saturate the inverter, so for instance, if you have a, uh, an inverter that's set up for a, uh, a 40 amp circuit breaker, if you have more PV than the inverter can convert in, a, uh, in an AC based system, you will lose that energy. It'll be clipped and lost. It'll basically be dissipated as heat back into the atmosphere. In our case, because the battery and the PV are on the D side of the inverter, if there's excess energy, you simply store that away in the battery. It can go there freely uh, to be used later on when, uh, when energy costs are higher. So you get a lot of those kinds of advantages where the limitations that you have on the AC side that would, that would drive you to have either uh, design constraints or simply lost energy are you know, really removed when you're doing this on the DC side of the inverter, and you can simply shift uh, energy around without having to worry about uh, uh, the limitations of the uh, conversion device. Right, because then everything's kind of connected through one single breaker, or, or, you know, in most cases would be one single breaker that kind of leads to that entire little DC architecture. Exactly so. So it sounds like Solar Edge is really driving this this space so that we can kind of get into a more holistic ecosystem, right? This DC ecosystem. Can you talk about how that gives us more resiliency in our homes? Sure. The things that we're looking at with regard to resiliency within the ecosystem, you know, that those again come from a couple of different directions. Uh, I think it is worth talking about some of the kind of the macro things that we're seeing, especially here where uh, where I'm based in California, where we have PSPS events. Uh, you are in a situation where your electricity from the grid is uncertain. 
This has kind of always been the case in places like uh, uh, Florida and the South, where you have uh, do have hurricanes. Mm -hmm. uh, we see it very heavily in in Puerto Rico, where uh, electricity uncertainty is uh, is increasing. And the ability to simply say, "Hey, I have additional energy right now. I want to store it in a battery so that when I lose." Uh, power from the grid that I have the ability to consume it is is becoming forefront. It's very, very interesting to note that in the rest of the world, which actually seems to have a more resilient grid, at least in Europe, they are not as interested in backup. But here in uh, in North America, we find that backup energy and being able to stay on, on power, at least, uh, is one of the primary drivers for homeowners to purchase uh, PV plus battery systems. Having said that, the trick in any system that you have, whether it's on grid or off grid, uh, is to be able to figure out how to use your self generated energy when you need it. If you're off grid, then you want to make sure that you can consume what what energy that you want without having to think about it too hard. You don't have to sit there staring at a light switch, trying to decide whether you can afford to turn on a light or not. You want to make sure that your system is managing itself so that if you ask for something that the system will provide the energy that you want. Uh, so to that end, you know, we will be coming out with a series of, of smart energy devices that will allow you to do things like say, hey, I'm in a backup mode. Uh, this would be a great time to curtail my uh, my pool pump or uh, or even turn off the air conditioner compressor unless I really want it. And then the uh, homeowner doesn't have to think too hard about what they can and can't do. Similarly, when you're on grid. Uh, and you want to be able to uh, control how much energy you're pulling from the grid. You know, we're moving into a state where uh, we're seeing much more time of use rates and energy when we're home is much more expensive than when we're away. Uh, so we want to be able to shift our usage from uh, times that uh, that energy is, is expensive to times when energy is less expensive. So there's this dual desire to make it possible to control how much energy you're consuming when you don't have the grid. And that's coupled with the desire to uh, sh change when you use the energy while you're on the grid in order to uh, kind of manage your economics. That's really uh, not only meeting the need for resiliency, but also making uh, uh, systems much more economic than they were in the past. And want to take a minute to define the acronym that you used earlier in your statement, PSPS, so uh, power safety shutoff events. How, what's the... Um, yeah, yeah, the public safety power shutdown. And, and we're going to be going into yet another exciting summer here in, in California, where we've had uh, unusually dry weather. Uh, and uh, uh, it's going to get windy and it's going to get hot. And what the we have proven is that we can, in fact, sue our uh, uh, utility when uh, the uh, the wires create a spark and cause a fire. You know, that's, right. uh, that was a big deal. And the utilities are all responding by simply saying, if it is hot, if it is windy, if I think that there might be line slap and that I would therefore start a fire, I'm going to turn off the uh, the energy, uh, and oftentimes they're shutting down uh, whole communities for uh, for hours, days, sometimes weeks at a time uh, until the utility determines that they can safely afford to turn the power back on again. That's unusual. That's never really happened before. So in in a way, that's a sea change for one of the largest PV markets in the world. So Magnus, we have a new batch of Solar Edge Energy Bank batteries on their way to our warehouses right now. And it sounds like there's a really exciting change. The, the new batch is going to have been tested to UL9540A test procedures. Can you tell us a little bit more about the test procedures and how they will impact the way that customers are planning on using the new Solar Edge Energy Bank batteries that we'll be receiving soon? Um, sure, Aaron. So a couple of things. First of all, with regard to the UL9540 A tests, they are pretty substantial. The test essentially is proof that under the worst conditions that can be uh, that can be conceived of, that the uh, that the equipment proves that when it's installed, as it is uh, uh, mentioned in our manuals, that the that the risk of any uh, propagation of fire is very very low. So pretty extreme, right? They're basically forcing the batteries to go through a thermal runaway event, even if that means they have to like crush the cell or something or light it on fire themselves, right? What's that. Right, right, exactly. So this is not a series of tests that determine whether uh, the battery uh, will uh, will spontaneously catch on fire, but instead, if the battery really has started ca caught on fire because you know some whatever incident has caused it, will one cell catching on fire propagate to the next cell and therefore cascade and cause uh, cause a, cause a larger fire? Thermal um, runaway event. Yeah. yeah. If 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 you wish, exactly so. 
you know, and and it, the way the way that you could think of it is that uh, you know if you hold two matches and you hold them close enough together, if you light one, the other one will catch on fire. This is proof that if you uh, you know you light one match, the next one won't catch. Uh, that is more or less how the 9548 test is done. It is done in a, a sealed chamber. Uh, it is heavily monitored by a uh, by an independent lab, and based on the behavior of the equipment, uh, people can make determination of uh, of whether or not it is allowed to install batteries closer than the uh, than the current fire code allows. Generally, the mm -hmm. fire code right now says that if you've got two batteries, um, you should put them about three feet apart. Uh, it really depends on which where you happen to be and what. Uh, you know the jurisdiction and uh, and with the local codes, but broadly speaking, that is uh, that is the case. Yeah, and that I, I know that that's created some challenges for folks that are using products like the Energy Bank because it's not just three feet from any other battery; it's also three feet from windows and doors, or there there are some limitations, I believe, in terms of uh, proximity to windows and doors as well. So it can really limit the size, the potential size of these battery backup installations. Yeah, that's right. So essentially what we wanted to do was go through the testing that ensures that everyone understands that if there is some sort of catastrophic event, uh, probably externally generated, that one battery won't affect the other one. So uh, we've gone through that. Um, what we have essentially been able to establish is uh, what's uh, what's thought of as reduced spacing. So you can now put the batteries uh, within, I believe the, the distance is, uh, is six inches. Uh, we have a, uh, a letter to that effect uh, that we can provide on an as needed basis for folks that shows that uh, that reduced spacing is, uh, is is now allowed with these batteries that you have uh, have arriving. That's that's a really exciting development for your team. It's going to mean that the energy bank can be used for larger installations, hopefully in a single site, the batteries will be able to um, be installed closer together. What changed from one version of the battery to the next that enabled the Solar Edge team to be able to write this letter saying that they could be installed a little bit more closely? Well, I'll start off by saying that the that the letter that we're talking about is uh, is not authored by us. It is authored by a third party engineer. Uh, ah, thanks we certainly for don't want to be self serving and write such a letter ourselves. In terms of the changes, the uh, fundamental battery design is is unchanged. Uh, it was a, a very solid design, so there's a, there's not a huge uh, uh, difference there. However, we made some subtle uh, uh, mechanical differences in order to sort of do some optimization of uh, of the behavior in the case that you get a uh, um, uh, you know a single cell that starts to combust. So that seems like it's really impacting the safety of the battery itself. Is there any other safety features that you guys are working on for your battery or that you have instituted with, with this home battery system? Safety with the battery, I think, is, an, is a really important topic. However, it is one that we felt quite confident with uh, from the very beginning. It has been heavily tested in order to ensure that there is no uh, risk of, of anything getting carried away. I should point out that the incidents of, of actual events are relatively rare and they tend to constellate around uh, uh, design issues. So, you know, I encourage anyone to go through and look at issues that come up and, you know, who they come up with and so on. Uh, so there, it's not actually something that we are, uh, we're not trying to mitigate a problem that we had. We're simply trying to uh, optimize uh, the design that, uh, that we were already working with. So to that end, there's not a lot of, uh, of changes around the battery because we, we felt pretty comfortable with where we were. Right. Solar Edge is and has been and continues to be and will be focused on safety. This is actually one of our hallmarks within the industry. Uh, we uh, pioneered with, uh, with the safety C concept that allowed people to uh, install on the rooftop without the presence of high voltage. We have made an incredible strides since the very beginning with the uh, uh, the detection of arc faults. We do now uh, ensure that we can detect any arc faults that might happen in the bat wiring between the battery and the inverter. But where we've really made some uh, some big strides in terms of safety most recently is actually on the rooftop, not at the battery. So what you'll see us releasing over the next couple of months is uh, something that we call Sense Connect. And uh, up on the uh, up on the roof, as we know, we've got uh, PV wire going from uh, module to optimizer, or in a traditional system, module to module. And uh, you know, you get an accumulation of uh, of things on the roof, uh, pine needles, leaves, and whatnot. We want to make sure that there's no possibility of ignition up there. So we are now actually measuring the temperature of the connectors in order to uh, to ensure that if for whatever reason an installer made an error, maybe they installed the, the connectors under tension and they're starting to pull apart and you're starting to see an arc in there, that will detect it. 
And when we detect that kind of a, uh, an issue, we will initially flag it and say, hey, there's a problem up there. You might want to look at it if it's just getting a little hot. If it gets very hot, we will shut down the system and alert the uh, whoever's monitoring the system that there was an issue there that needs to be addressed. And so is that part of the monitoring program that you guys offer? It's a combination of our monitoring system and of our optimizers. So mm. we have been um, launching uh, a new series of op optimizers. Uh, you'll see them on uh, uh, in your warehouse. They're called 440 uh, mm -hmm. and the S500. Uh, so these are the optimizers that we've uh, we've moved to. And what we will be releasing over the next few months is the ability of our monitoring system to detect the, any uh, issues that have gone on, gone on with those optimizers and create the shutdown event. That's so very cool. It's a combination of optimizers. It's the inverter monitoring, and then it's the uh, uh, the global monitoring platform that uh, that go together in order to uh, uh, to create this level of safety. Yeah, we actually have our our first S four forty orders in in our warehouses now, so folks can go to our web store and check that out. Get more information about that product. That is a really exciting improvement in um, overall system safety. Having that measurement at the point of connection to ensure that nothing is going wrong on the roof, I think is really going to help prevent what used to be one of the most common points of failure within the system, which is the point of connection between the module and whatever it's connecting to, right? Yeah, yeah those connectors failing can lead to um, really terrible outcomes, like in worst case scenarios, fires, right? So right. being able to keep an eye on that with like a, a global monitoring solution or global monitor, monitoring platform like the one that SolarEdge employs is, is going to be very exciting for our customers. Right. I, I should point out here that it's a within this industry, we are all concerned about, you know, what the negative outcomes uh, can be. It is not as if there is a, uh, a huge incidence of, of these kinds of events, especially in the residential space. Otherwise, you'd be reading about it every bit every day. We as a company, and I think we as an industry, uh, owe it to ourselves and, and to our customers to really focus on it. But it is, uh, if you will, kind of trying to be, uh, uh, you know, more than normally careful about this when it comes to residential homes. Having said that, we have seen a couple of very high profile um, events on the commercial side. So a, com a couple of commercial rooftops have uh, shown up in the remote in the news, uh, you know, pretty dramatically. Those had nothing to do with us, of course. But what people are, are, are beginning to understand is that, you know, having module level shutdown so that you can uh, uh, do the kind of disconnect that's now mandated in, uh, in NEC 2017 and 2020 really does make a, uh, a difference for uh, safety, especially for these uh, these larger higher voltage systems. And that's an area where, you know, quite frankly, we're making some uh, some very strong design wins. So I would encourage people to have a plan for large systems about how they are going to manage the risks uh, that come with having high voltage PV on the rooftop. In some cases, it may be worthwhile to consider for already existing systems to re-install uh, equipment that will provide uh, uh, enhanced fire safety because we are seeing these uh, these systems pop into the news every once in a while and, it, and it's to no one's benefit. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's not necessarily just for safety, right? That's the most extreme outcome, but this would affect system efficiency as well, inevitably, correct? Absolutely the case. And one thing that, uh, uh, that is worth saying that on the, on the commercial and industrial side, and, and also increasingly on the utility scale side, being able to extract as much energy from the system as possible with module level optimization is a, a tremendous advantage. In some cases, again, what we're finding is that it, it, with older systems, since you are seeing deterioration of the modules over time, and sometimes the deterioration of one module versus another is not the same, and you're getting you know more module mismatch, that actually it, it increases the, uh, the value of the system to provide module level optimization, even if it's already been installed uh, for some years. Yeah, it'd be interesting to to see any any case studies that y'all have done on uh, situations where installers have done that and, and seen a lot of benefit from it. So Magnus, coming back to the smart home and setting installers up for success, I understand that your online designer actually has some additional features that you guys have added recently. Can you speak to that? Sure. And uh, one thing I'll start off talking about is just the designer overall. So this is an online tool. Anybody who has uh, credentials uh, as an installer to log into our platform has access to designer. We do not charge for it. And uh, we find that it's very, very useful for people. Um, yeah, it's a great tool. I use it frequently. I can, I can. As do that. I, as someone who <laughs> yeah. does not design their own systems, <laughs> I also use it. 
Great. To know. I mean, we, we started off some years ago uh, launching it as a, uh, as a way of ensuring that you're picking the right optimizer with the right module. But what we have done is we've made significant investment in the tool in order to make it you know, world-class so, so that it, it competes head-to-head with uh, platforms that you pay real money for for a subscription. You know, we have added a couple of really key features to it. I mean, there is now 3D mod- modeling built in. You can model shading. You can see performance of shading over time. So you can uh, see which areas of a rooftop will be provided with uh, some degradation based on a based on a tree. You can either move the module or suggest to the homeowner that they uh, do a little bit of trimming. We can also do roof outline detection at this point, and not just the outer parts of the roof, but also be able to detect the inner edges so that if you, you have a hip someplace that you can find it and you can do just push and pull in order to get a quick and accurate 3D representation of the uh, of the home when you're putting down modules. There's also the, the, the classic application of using it to just find out which optimizers will match the module that you're looking at using for your latest applications. Absolutely the case. So if you pick a module and then ask the tool to say which optimizer should I use, it will tell you. And uh, the nice thing is that when it tells you which, uh, which optimizer to use, that is kind of de facto solar edges uh, guarantee of warranty that these two things made together uh, if uh, if there's any issue with the uh, with the optimizer uh, that we we warranted that this optimizer is paired with this uh, with this module successfully, so that's uh, that's important. It'll also uh, design your strings, and if you want to have it uh, just uh, do uh, a module placement on a rooftop, uh, it does a, a a really good job of that. So it is uh, very much an an end to end tool, and we are continually adding to it. Most recently, uh, Tierney, as you were uh, alluding to, we now have battery modeling built in. So if you are uh, going to be doing a a home installation and you know something about the actual consumption data for that home, you can model what's going to happen to uh, the homeowner's uh, grid uh, uh, purchases based on uh, on modeling that's done in there. And therefore, you can go to a homeowner and say, if I install one battery, this is what that's going to mean for your bill, given the TOU rates that you're facing. If I install two batteries, this is what that, that's going to make. And now they can make a, a, a real dollars and cents decision about uh, what they uh, about what they want. I think that's really important. I know that that is one of the biggest challenges that I mean, I'm in Arizona, and so a lot of installers, you know, we have a more reliable grid, as it were, versus California. And so a lot of installers are maybe struggling to get battery attachment rates increasing in their in their jurisdiction. But when you can kind of point directly to what that dollar and cents would look like, that's really compelling for a homeowner, and that really increases your attachment rate. Absolutely. Um, and we do take in the uh, data on the uh, um, on the utility costs. So you can start, you know, very much modeling what's going to happen to your pennies every day. Yeah. Some other things that we've added to it, though, uh, uh, that I should uh, should talk about, because one of the things that uh, people have asked for and we've listened is that they do want to be able to do uh, create drawings either after they do this modeling or take the drawings that they've created and port it into the model. So we do now allow people to, uh, to you know, do uh, drawings in AutoCAD, upload it, and we will then take those drawings and we'll be able to do uh, module placement directly onto them uh, and do the calculations that way. Nice. Concurrently, if you create the design in Designer and you want to uh, uh, port that into AutoCAD, you know, because you have a, uh, a series of plan sets that you're going to be submitting to the AHJ, we do now also uh, allow uh, downloading of DXF files uh, of the model for, uh, for use that way. So a lot of exciting things in there, you know, not just the, the battery modeling, but, uh, but increased uh, 3D capabilities with, uh, with the uh, outline and uh, inner edge detection, uh, as well as uh, much better interaction with, uh, with AutoCAD-based uh, tools that are out there. Well, Magnus, it's been a delight chatting with you today. I have another question for you, and then we can we can call it quits. I'm curious what your you know what you're focusing on for the future. What are the next steps for Solar Edge? What kind of things do you are you excited about? 
Well, there are a lot of things to be uh, to be excited about. I mean, as I spoke about at the beginning, we see this move towards electrification for reasons both that we would want to see, which would be uh, trying to uh, uh, preserve the planet and trying to uh, uh, make our own reason, and, and with reasons that we don't want to see. You know, the the decreasing resilience uh, of the grids uh, mm -hmm. and the uncertainty in the uh, the energy market with uh, uh, with some things that are beyond homeowners' control. You right. know, we really want to uh, address all of that with our products. You've seen it, uh, you know, starting off with PV, we've added uh, the ability to uh, to work in backup so that you're not required to be on the grid in order to use your, uh, your PV. We now make our own battery. We now provide whole home backup. And where you'll see us going is increasing ability to control your energy through a, a series of smart devices, so smart switches, uh, smart relays, the uh, interaction of our EV charger uh, with uh, uh, with the inverter in order to know, hey, I've got enough energy to do what, what needs to be done, uh, smart hot water heater controls, uh, just a whole series of devices that are going to make people continuing to have the lifestyle that they want, while at the same time, really, really maximizing their uh, energy consumption in a way that uh, that is as inexpensive as possible. That's really where it's at. The uh, vision that we have is that energy should be something that, that helps people have delightful lives. They shouldn't have to think about it all the time unless they happen to be curious. And we want to make it so that those goals that we had of, of resiliency, of, uh, of independence, are, are met uh, and that people can uh, uh, can get back to the their usual job of, of, of living their life and uh, uh, spending time with their families. I really love the way you put that uh, energy for, for mm -hmm. people to have delightful lives. That's yeah, <laughs> sweet. <laughs> Work hard. Such a fantastic goal for everyone. Yeah. Magnus, it's been so wonderful to catch up with you, hear more about what Solar Edge has been working on and about some of the great advances that y'all are making over there. Really appreciate you joining the show and look forward to connecting with you again soon. Yeah, it's been a real pleasure. I, I love talking with all y'all. It's always great to talk to Magnus. I'm so glad he was able to join us and chat a little bit more about what their batteries have to have to offer. Yeah, we have those in stock right now. So if you have any questions about them, reach out. We'll uh, get you some answers. Yeah, I'm really excited that they have a, a 9540A test report that shows mm -hmm. that they can stop the batteries from combusting any of the other batteries that are nearby so that they can be installed more closely together. That's going to position them very well to compete in those markets where, mm -hmm. you know, space is tight and the distance that's required between battery units is significant without a 9540A test report saying that it's safe to put them any closer together. So I'm stoked that their team has taken the steps needed to get that under their belt and um, you know it's a challenging process it's a new process so congrats to them yep and you know we're always excited to nerd out about this kind of thing and hear about new innovations so uh, thanks again to magnus at solar edge and thanks to you for listening to us nerd out about this stuff yeah and we'll see you next time <laughs>